Good morning, all. My name is Lisa Lay, and I am the director of the Pre-Pharmacy Club, sorry, conference this year. On behalf of the UC Davis Pre-Health Student Alliance, I'd like to welcome you all to the 11th annual Pre-Pharmacy and Pre-Health Professions National Conference. Alongside with a pre-medical conference, the event has now expanded to include pre-pharmacy, pre-public health, pre-dentistry, and pre-nursing conferences. We will have a full weekend of events ahead of you, and each workshop will be repeated twice. So please use the conference schedule in your program to plan out your conference weekend. Some workshops will be recorded and broadcasted live for our online audience, and they will be archived for future viewings. I'd also like to point out that we do have a student panel at 1 o'clock here in Rock Hall. So if you'd like, you may grab lunch at 12.30 PM and come back here at 1 to listen to some of our wonderful student ph pharmacists speak about how to become a successful um, applicant and uh, student pharmacists. I'd also like to rem kindly remind everyone to put your cell phones on silent and to limit your movement as a courtesy to our other speakers and other attendees. Last but not least, I'd like to thank everyone who um, has made it to the conference today. Um, thank you to the people who have made the conference possible. Um, I'd like to thank the entire conference staff the AAMC for uh, sponsoring the video portion of the conference, as well as to thank you to all of our speakers who have made it uh, to our conference this weekend. I'd also like to give special thanks to my wonderful six pre-pharmacy coordinators, um, with, without whom this conference would not have been possible. Lastly, thank you all again for attending this year's first full day conference and for giving us the chance to inspire, inform, and involve you in the fantastic field of pharmacy. As UC Davis students, we are honored to have you all here today as we take great pride in our conference as our achievement and contribution to our fellow students. I am honored to introduce our first keynote speaker. She is the Executive Vice President and CEO of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. She previously served as the Senior Vice President for Policy Planning and Communications with the American Pharmacists Association. She served on the faculty at the University of Minnesota, where she practiced the field of geriatrics and was an associate professor and associate dean at the Samford University School of Pharmacy. She is a graduate, uh, graduate, pharmacy graduate of Auburn, University and received her doctorate at the University of Minnesota. Her research includes projects on aging, pharmacy manpower, and pharmacy-based immunizations. She has been active in leadership roles in the profession. Now please help me welcome Dr. Lucinda May. Let me switch. Good morning. I am absolutely delighted to be here and just need, and I may need your help to, to find my slides. I'll let you do that while, while I just get started. I am delighted to be here, and thank you for your participation this morning. Um, I want to call out that I'm accompanied by several of my colleagues, including Jen Adams, who is Ms. Farmcast, in case you are interested in meeting her. She will be here all day and actually leads two workshops, if I'm not mistaken. Terrific. Um, as I was thinking about um, what you might want to hear me say this morning, my guess is, is that you want me to tell you all of the wonderful things about pharmacy and why you should be interested in joining our profession. And I decided to flip that on its head and not do that. And I decided, as you can tell by my title, to ask you to think about why should pharmacy want me? Why should I be considered a good applicant for one of the 130 and growing schools and colleges of pharmacy in the United States? And so I'm going to spend my time this morning equipping you with some answers to that question of why should pharmacy want me. So you're going to be ahead of the game of approximately 19,000 other people who are interested in joining one of our schools. 
and colleges not too long from now. And so I asked some questions that you might want to ask. I need to know where this profession is going, especially over the, the near term, but think about it. You're going to be in this profession for 40 years, 50 years maybe. Who knows? And all, the only thing I can leave you with today that is an absolute truth is the profession of pharmacy and healthcare is going to change more in the next 40 years than it has changed in the last 100. There is absolutely no question about that. And we'll talk about what some of those forces of change are. How do your strengths, what is it that you know about yourself that line up with these changes that I'm going to talk about that are on the very real horizon? Because change is going to happen, I think, quite rapidly over this next couple of years. As Kathy told me, 5 million Californians come into the healthcare system previously uninsured, probably a lot of them kind of train wrecks. And they're going to need a lot of health professions help. And then finally, the ultimate question is why should a college of pharmacy invite me to join them and enroll in their school? So let's get going. So what does my crystal ball actually tell me is coming? There's a couple of things that we know. Well, first of all, we know we spend an extraordinary amount of money in this country on health care. And a lot of it, estimated somewhere 20, 25%, 30% is a waste, is wasted dollars that could actually be directed to a lot of other things like maybe higher education and decrease the cost of education for you all. But within the spending that we currently do on health care, 75% of all expenditures go toward the treatment of chronic illness, hypertension, uh, diabetes, arthritis, etc. And what do we know about the treatment of those conditions? Virtually in all cases, I don't think there is an exception, medication is the predominant form of therapy for the patients who are diagnosed with those conditions. And whereas in the past, when I was a pre-pharmacy student in pharmacy school, people used to say, you know, medications only, only constitute about 5% of total health care costs. The federal government didn't include them in Medicare, so they really couldn't be all that important, right? And if a physician prescribed it and the FDA said it was safe and effective, what do I need to worry about medications for? Well, in the course of my lifetime, 30 plus years in the profession, that equation has changed a lot. Drugs now rival hospitalization as one of the leading costs of, of, of health care in the country and growing. Uh, and we have come to appreciate that when they're not used properly, they cost. They cost money, they cost health, they cost lives. And so the role of the pharmacist has become really a, a significantly more important over the course of the last couple of decades. But so has the word value. In policy circles in Washington, and I hate to even admit right now that I'm from Washington, D.C., because it's really a mess. So let's, let's stay focused on the West Coast. But throughout the country, the question of how do we improve the value of health care delivery is a critical question. And the equation is relatively simple, yet complex to achieve. People want higher quality health care that achieve better health outcomes. You know, even though we spend more than anybody else in the world, our outcomes of care are not the best. In fact, they're, they're, they're low. They're, they're worse than in some uh, under-resourced countries. And, they, and the people who care about value want better outcomes, better care at lower cost. We can't sustain the, the cost, excuse me, the contributions that we're currently making in terms of health care spending. And so as I thought about what's going to achieve value in this evolving, changing healthcare delivery system that is important to you as an aspiring pharmacist, what are the things you need to be able to talk about to the people who want to see whether or not you're a qualified candidate for their program? And there are four things, I'll talk about each of them in succession, and I've highlighted the words that I think are the most important. Science and research and precision diagnosis will become increasingly more important as patients become more complex. So the individual patient has, has a, 
a uh, profile to be identified to be discovered through science and precision diagnosis. And yet at the same time, we know that if we work on care just one patient at a time, we're missing the boat. And so attention is increasingly moving toward what's the health needs of a population, even down to a specific zip code. Maybe the incidence of, of high blood pressure in this particular zip code is, is disproportionately high in relationship to the, the state in general or the, or the city in general. What is it about the people who are residing in that zip code? Maybe they only have fast food restaurants to eat at. That, that we should pay attention so that as healthcare practitioners, we can direct the right amount of preventive services and primary intervention most where it's needed across the community. And prevention, more so than chasing after people after they've become sick, is becoming increasingly important. Then the other, and I spend a disproportionate amount of my time now working with AAMC and other colleagues across the health profession space on interprofessional learning and team-based care. Because we've also come to acknowledge the fact that no one clinician has enough knowledge to take care of patients all by themselves. And I hope that really excites you, because one of the things that we know about interprofessional learning and team-based care is it's actually more fun than the way we used to do it before. People enjoy working together to solve patients' problems and to help people get better. And that's becoming mainstream. And then the fourth trend that I want to talk about briefly is we live in an era of accountability. And there's a, a number of organizations and a number of ways that accountability is becoming very mainstream. So I'm going to go back over the four of each of those in a little bit more detail. So old science and new science is core to where pharmacy is going. Science is foundational, and I guess the, the bad news in that is, is, is that we can't abandon the study of chemistry and physiology and biology while we pick up the sciences of immunology, genomics, genetics, etc. And so that means that the intensity of science learning in our health profession space, and specifically pharmacy, is getting even more complex. And the kinds of science listed to the right of the slide are things that probably don't yet appear necessarily in classes that you're going to take. Now, pharmacogenomics is moving into the core pharmacy curriculum, undisputably. But what computational science, big data, we now have the potential to take these databases that exist with lots and lots of patient information in order to highlight that zip code where a disproportionate number of patients with a particular condition reside. And if I'm the pharmacist working in a clinic in that zip code, I need to know that information and I need to have my ability to work with large databases. Nanotechnology is going to drive drug in infinitely small particles, like, like right into the cancer cell that needs it rather than in all the cells around it, to increase the ability of that drug to cure patients without causing the harm that we know that the broader, um, non-discrete drug molecules of the old has done. Systems engineering is really important because we need to redesign the delivery systems and the information systems and informatics in order to be able to, again, equip you as a clinician with the information that you need. And then, even before you get into school, we've increasingly understood that the social determinants of health have an important role to play in patients' status and in patient outcomes. And you as a pharmacist really need to understand what those words mean, and it drives off of your psychology, your sociology, your economics, and some of those classes, that you may wonder, why are those important to me? I would also mention from a career perspective that you could specialize in any single one of those and many other bullets. And you can do it maybe with some of your electives in a PharmD program, 
But you also might want to think about thinking about it from a dual degree perspective. Do a dual degree in public health. Do a dual degree in informatics. And your marketability on the other end of your degree program will be, uh, will be improved markedly. So then this issue of no one clinician being able to do it all. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me, I got ahead of myself because I can see the next slide. You can only see the slide that's on, this, on the screen. So let's talk about prevention and the early detection of diseases. The National Association of Chain Drug Stores has published the factoid, if you will, that 94% of the U.S. population resides less than five miles from a pharmacy. And in urban areas, it's more like over 95% of the population resides less than two miles from a community pharmacy. When I was in school, NACDS again issued the declaration that the, the equivalent of the American population crossed the threshold of a community pharmacy every single week. I've recently begun to think about that and realized that that was before every big box Target Walmart every Ralph Savon Super Value Safeway grocery store, uh, and you name it, um, added a pharmacy to their retail environment. And so we are distributed beyond most people's wildest imaginations, and that's only in the, in the retail context. And of course, there are pharmacists in clinics, hospitals, physicians' offices. And that access gives us the unique ability to reach populations of people even before they're sick. I walked through Safeway in my, in my town of Arlington, Virginia, and the overhead page is constantly talking about what the pharmacists in that store can offer the public. Immunization services have certainly become broadly distributed. But there's also opportunities for pharmacists and those in other settings to do point of care testing. I might not know that my high blood pressure is high because it's relatively silent. But the pharmacist in so many of these settings has the ability, the knowledge and the skills to detect those early warning signs of disease even before I or my internal medicine physician has been able to diagnose it. And that also extends then into a lot of powerful opportunities for health education and disease management services that are well documented now as being able to be delivered by pharmacists. And now my favorite subject, the fact that we have come to appreciate the fact that no one healthcare practitioner can provide the care that satisfies the need of every single patient, and especially I would comment patients who are particularly complex. Back to my introduction, I've long been intrigued by the needs of older patients, the geriatric population, who disproportionately have one or more chronic diseases and might be trying to manage three, four, five, twelve different prescription products, non-prescription products simultaneously. They are the people who desperately need access on an ongoing basis to a highly skilled and patient-focused pharmacist to help them truly understand what each and every one of their medicines does, why they're taking it, and what they need to be able to recognize in case it's not quite working as perfectly as intended. There are some things that you need to focus on skill-wise if you want to be able to function effectively as part of a, of a health care team. You need to understand what the roles and responsibilities of all the other players are. And they need to understand what pharmacists bring to the game, what pharmacists bring to the party. There are ways to increase your skills in teamwork and collaboration. And the organizers of this weekend have honed those skills very effectively. There's a lot of communication, and most of the errors that happened in healthcare happen because of poor communication. 
And so those are incredibly important skills for you. And then teams will work best when the players in them come into the relationship with very strong values and ethics that you share with other members of the team. I mentioned that I work very closely with my colleagues in allopathic and osteopathic medicine, dentistry, nursing, and public health. And about five years ago now, we set out to create a collaboration, a formal collaboration called the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. And the first thing we did together is issue this report that you see on the screen. And this is where those four competencies that I just mentioned were refined and focused on as important to every health profession learner across the space. But as I thought about that from your perspective, when does that become important to you as a prospective pharmacist, a prospective pharmacy student? And I'd, I'd like to focus on the fact that the answer to that is now. Because you will have opportunities in your pre-health professions education to collaborate, well, not, maybe not to collaborate, but certainly to learn with schools, students who are headed to other disciplines. And, and it's, never, it's never too early to begin to build those relationships, to begin to build that understanding, and even to perhaps collaborate, as I suspect in many cases you do, in your pre-pharmacy, pre-med, pre-health uh, clubs and, and groups, to do some work together, maybe to do some, some campus-based education on the health professions, et cetera. It's important to you in admissions it is now the case that interprofessional education is an expectation in the accreditation standards of all of the health professions. In pharmacy, that's been true for a long time. That's been true as long as the, as the accreditation standard for pharmacy was, was at the PharmD level. And interprofessional learning was in that original standard. And it's in our standard 13 times now. Thank you. 13 times, if you don't think that our schools are paying attention to making sure that you have the opportunity as a learner to learn with, from, and about other members of the healthcare team. I was at a school in the South recently doing a site visit, and it happened to be an interview day. And so I was taken into this simulation laboratory, and I was able to observe some of the multiple mini-interview mini activities that were going on that day. And in one scenario, a young person was asked, a candidate was asked, essentially, if a physician presents a patient with a prescription that has an error in it, is, what is your responsibility as a pharmacist in that scenario? This person maybe hadn't come equipped with all of the insight that he needed. Because he basically said to the interviewer, oh, I would never question a physician's prescription. Thank you for reacting that way this morning, even at this early hour. Because, George, that went out of vogue decades and decades ago. And so it is very likely in your interview activities at admission that you're going to be asked either maybe to role play the role of the pharmacist in relationship to other providers, or at least talk about what you think your role will be. You can download that document from our website, aacp.org, and read all about it before you go. But then the exciting thing is, is that you're going to begin to see opportunities to do interprofessional learning in a variety of different contexts, in core classes, but also maybe in simulated learning. This is the University of Minnesota, where they've done a mock emergency, mass, mass casualty drill. And those are people from all kinds of different health professions who are having to learn how to respond to an emergency together. 
a little bit more standard. That's not a real person lying on that bed, of course. That's Harvey the Sim Man. But many, many universities have invested significant dollars in simulation centers. And you'll learn with other health professions learners how to do a code, how to deliver a baby, how to do all kinds of exciting things. And then my final point relates to accountability. We have lived in a highly unaccountable healthcare system. And our clinicians have practiced in that environment for years, but that game is done. Nowadays, Medicare providers are rated using the five-star Medicare rating. And the most important thing about that is Kaiser will know how many of those ratings are dependent upon the quality of medication use management in their health system. And a lot of those five-star ratings depend upon pharmacists helping Kaiser manage medication use effectively. And, and Kaiser gets much more money if they're a five-star than a three-star. It's important to Kaiser. And pharmacists, through the Pharmacy Quality Alliance, are being evaluated and have a dashboard for their performance. And it's only just begun, but it will become so much more important over the course of your career. And so the final question I ask of you today is, how are you going to convince the College of Pharmacy that they want you? And I would say your answer lies somewhere in those bullets to the right. I'm a strong scientist and a compassionate caregiver. I'm curious. I'm a great team player. I'm a leader. I want to be an agent of change. These are the key words that in your essays, in your interviews, will make you a winner in the game of pharmacy admissions. Thanks so much for having me here today, and I really encourage you to visit with my colleagues from AACP and our schools and colleges of pharmacy, including my alma mater, Auburn, and um, have a great weekend. Thanks so much.